Iceland is no stranger to geothermal and has decades of experience in harnessing and utilizing geothermal resources for domestic heating, industrial purposes, and power generation. My name is Priscilla Gagliano, and I'll be your moderator. I'm joined today by three very experienced gentlemen to discuss the topic of deep drilling in Iceland and its geothermal impact. Unfortunately, one of our panelists was unable to join due to unforeseen circumstances. So panelists, would you please introduce yourselves? Yes, uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. My name is Gunnar Gunnarsson. I'm an experimental physicist by training, but I've been working as a senior geoscientist at the Reykjavik Energy, or OR, and mainly been responsible for uh, reservoir modeling and the reservoir management that has led me to uh, deep geothermal. So we are trying to expand our uh, utilization downwards. Preston? Shall I take the next one? So, my name is Christian Ingerson. I'm a mechanical engineer at Manvit Engineering, which is now owned by Kowi of Denmark. I've been involved in geothermal utilization for, well, over over 30 years, and in particular in, in, in ITDP, I have been involved as a deep drilling project. I've been involved since 2001, uh, where I have been participating in well design and, and uh, fluid uh, identification and utilization of the fluid. Yes, hello everyone, and my name is Bjarni Paulsson. I'm a petroleum engineer by training. But I'm currently executive director of geothermal development at Landsvirkjun, the national power company of Iceland. And I've been with Landsvirkjun for about 22 years now. And uh, in, the, in the past, I was the project manager for the Iceland deep drilling project number one. And I'm currently working on a new project, a spin-off from that called Krabla Magma Testbed. Well, thank you and welcome. So depending on where you live in the world, Drilling for geothermal resources can be so vastly different. So today we want to talk about deep drilling for super hot resources. So my first question is, what do we mean by super hot geothermal? And is it different from super critical? Yeah, well, super hot is a new term that we've been using. Uh, previously, we were always talking about super critical, which means that we were going to formations where the temperature is higher than 373 centigrades and the pressure higher than 220, so over the critical point. However, we are now more focused on, on the energy content of the fluid. So the term super hot uh, means that we are, we are, we are producing a fluid that is always in a steam phase. So has higher energy content than or higher enthalpy than uh, 2,800 kilojoules per kilogram. And uh, this is when we are not bound to the depth or, or the pressure. So we can reach uh, resources that are at shallow depths and not super critical because the pressure in those formations are, is lower. However, the energy content of the fluid is, is higher than in conventional uh, geothermal. So how do you find these resources and what kind of targets are you looking for? Well, I guess that's uh, the uh, quest for holy grail, really, to find this kind of resources. Obviously, you look for the geology first and experience. If you've been noticing something unusually hot in your area, and uh, in some cases, especially if you are in a volcanic active area, you may be looking for signs of magmatic intrusions, giving extra heat injection into your system. In other system, you may have extra hot, uh, for example, granite uh, bodies that can give very hot uh, high temperatures as well into your reservoir system, unusually high. So I think most commonly you, you would use methods like resistivity measurements or, or uh, seismic pictures to notice if you see signs of uh, for example, end of a brittle rock, that's where you will have rock, which is probably going to be exceptionally hot and, and likely to give very high heat into your geothermal reservoir system. So how deep are these resources typically? 
That's a good question. We we have uh, originally we always wanted uh, in the IDDP SLT drilling project to drill down to 4.5 kilometers to get these super hot resources. But uh, the first well of the project hit magma at the depth of 2.1 kilometer approximately. And uh, we at uh, OR Reykjavik Energy we have uh, recently drilled a well into very hot formation uh, at uh, around two kilometers depth and. Uh, Bjarni Pálsson can tell you about wells in, in Krabla that have also been drilled into very hot formations, more wells than IDTP-1. Yes, I can add on to that, that uh, there are several cases around the world where it seems like people have been encountering magmatic botics at a relatively shallow depth. And for some reason, the depth 2.1 kilometer seems like some kind of magical number in that terms both in Iceland, in uh, uh, Hawaii, and even possibly in Kenya as well, people have been encountering. But uh, in, in other parts of the world, you are, there are maybe no limits in terms of depth to, to find that. I guess if you drill deep enough, you will eventually find this kind of conditions. But uh, maybe for practical and economical reason, you will be looking for areas where you would find this at relatively shallow depths. And uh, three, four kilometer depth is something which is quite realistic to aim for. So why is finding these super hot geothermal resources so important and how would you use that energy? Well, the advantage of, of reason getting into super, super hot fluid is that the en uh, energy content of fluid is, is quite high. As Gordon was mentioning it, we are looking at the fluid where the enthalpy is yeah, 3000 kilos. Or so kilo or, or even higher, higher and this gives opportunity for power generation electrical power generation this is uh, gives us it will give us a good um, the efficiency will be quite high actually compared at least to a conventional one and uh, as a result uh, we uh, have the will be utilizing actually the resource in a better way uh, compared to a conventional approach uh, and we may expect that we will, the, the footprint of the plant will be smaller. There may be some advantages also related to where well, actually have been in, in an existing plant where the upper part has been utilized in the conventional way. There might be opportunities to drill deeper, to drill into the root, and that would be like an addition on the existing facilities. So it's good to give a good uh, financially uh, and as well as environmental from our environmental point of view also is an, would be an, considered an advantage. A little more bang for your buck, huh? Yeah, yeah I'd also <laughs> like, to, like to add to this that uh, because you mentioned uh, the resources, we, we uh, in Iceland, I think over 90% of homes are, are heated by geothermal, and, uh, almost every House in Reykjavik and surrounding municipalities are heated uh, by uh, geothermal power. And in recent years, the market or the demand for geothermal heating is, uh, has been growing uh, very fast or faster than anticipated. And uh, we are now trying to figure out how to meet this increased demand. And uh, going deeper is, uh, in my perspective, very a logical way to, to go to try to to utilize the deep heat in, in meeting this, this increasing demand. So once you've located an area for super hot geothermal, what must you consider when designing these wells? Well, the well design is, uh, well, the initial approach at least is similar to, to what is conventional, what we do in uh, wells. We, I need to uh, select casing depths, etc., etc. Uh, we uh, and for doing that, we will make some assumption on use of the design conditions of pressure, temperature, rate, estimated down downhole, uh, and what we'll come up with. We may come up with is uh, well, uh, these wells are tend to be deep and tend to be deep uh, drilled in hot areas. We may expect to have well, many casing strings, and there's one thing there to, to drill. Uh, I, I 
uh, deep well, the production part, uh, the, well, the diameter should be no less than eight and a half inch. And which means that when you add up the casing strings above you, end of the first are actually quite quite large. Uh, the, actually, we have also learned from experience that the, the design condition, condition, pressure, and temperature wise, we, uh, tend to be, uh, we tend to have assumed lower pressure than what is real, realized downhole and lower temperature as well. So actually, we can may expect from at least those models we have been using both higher pressure and higher temperature. But then, then we, we, yeah, that is, yeah, the, the similar approach. And another th approach there is we, we, the well needs to be designed, we believe, um, with a sacrificial casing. Mm -hmm. So that is also maybe have, 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 uh, have an effect on how, on the well design and the casing strings, how deep they are. So actually, meaning that a sacrificial case, and that even if the innermost casing is breaks down and fails, the well integrity is uh, still uh, remains. It's, it's uh, yeah, you no know, risk of losing the well. So what are the Maybe I can, if oh, you want, I can add to that a little bit. Obviously, oh. with with this kind of wells, you're going to have larger thermal stresses than we have in normal wells as well. So we have to account for that. And another factor is that, uh, you know, uh, solubility of, of minerals and gases is different for different pressures and temperatures. So we may also be seeing something quite different in terms of what kind of context of minerals and gases you will find in this kind of fluid as well. Uh, silica uh, and, and HCL gases and, and, and even HF gas as well. So that all is going to make the necessary requirement for a little bit different approach when you are designing this kind of well. So what are some of the technological challenges in deep drilling and how do you mitigate them? Yeah, well, the technical the challenges are, as I was pointing out, are related to high temperature thermostasis, which one can expect. And also the chemistry, the fluid chemistry is, is different from what and actually also when in uh, having a, a super hot fluid, um, it may have a different conditions or different uh, properties when it is in su super hot uh, uh, yeah, case or it is it remains super hot, but when it condenses, it uh, is a very, uh, we may expect a, a very corrosive fluid. So it actually it may be different. Um, the challenges may be different, whether it is in a uh, super hot condition compared to to being uh, when it concentrates, concentrates. And you will also expect to have some condensation. In, I mean, in the well during the beginning or shut down or something. So, so that is something which um, you can experience. So, what has been done there? Uh, the actually the. Thermal expansion can be approached, I guess, in two ways. Firstly, it is a strain problem rather than a stress problem. So that's uh, from the uh, technical calculation point of view. That's something one needs to be bear in mind. There have been some development regarding using flexible couplings, and that is one of the, the development. I Meaning flexible coupling means that the casing can actually expand. The thermal expansion uh, can be up taken into the well the couplings. So there will be neither no strain or stress due to thermal expansion in the casing. Uh, now the material selection is, is uh, which materials with respect to, to corrosion is a, is a challenging work and, and it's a, can be when is difficult. Uh, we actually have experienced that the cladding, and that it uh, has primarily been done on, on the equipment on surface, has been successful by using a cladding, a, con, a carbon steel cladding. And one of the challenges which we have faced there, I mean, we are using mostly conventional drilling technology, but the, the challenge is we need to have a good cementing of the casings, and that is a challenging part. So it means that we, the a good uh, cementing method, how to run the cement, is quite important and critical. 
Absolutely. And I add to that that uh, I mean the, the main lesson learned from the two wells that have already been drilled in the Iceland deep drilling project is that the uh, well technology or well design is not uh, ready for this. Uh, it needs to be improved. So we have, as my colleagues mentioned, uh, the heat uh, expansion of the casings that can cause casing failures and then the corrosive environment. And uh, there are two like chemical uh, problems with the fluid, that is uh, of course the corrosion, and that is something that happens when we have condensation. Even though we have a very little, uh, like uh, it's mainly chlorine that causes the problems, uh, chlorine in the, the steam will all go into the droplets when they form during condensation, creating a little tiny acid bombs that will corrode everything. And uh, then uh, we, we are trying to address these issues because it's our turn now at Reykjavik Energy to drill the well number three. And uh, we recently, uh, one year ago, we started a research project called Compass, where we are addressing these issues, uh, cementing or flexible cementing that can work with the uh, flexible couplings that uh, Christine mentioned. And then also cladding uh, pipes or cladding standard materials with, with some corrosive uh, resistant materials. So if we can uh, tackle these problems. And we are also in this project trying to, also in detail, trying to, to somehow pull it, do this in an economically sound way. This has to be economically sound, this project. We have to, to well, should not cost too much. And if I perhaps can add on to this, the final bit, I guess, which when it comes to drilling, uh, the geothermal industry is using equipment and tools developed for the oil and gas industry. And this equipment and tools have limited temperature tolerance. So therefore we need to keep the drilling fluid cool to, to make sure we have a, a sufficient lifetime of the drilling equipment downhole. And that causes the temperature inside the borehole to be a lot lower than the temperature of the formation rock that we are drilling in. And when we get deeper and into hotter formations, we are starting to see a very big difference. And, and this can cause uh, instability in the rock formation, making the wells unstable. So that's another issue that we have to consider, which is quite new, at least for the geothermal industry. Absolutely. Okay, so now we've discussed how to find a good resource and how to drill the well. What are the challenges of producing fluids from a super hot resource? Yeah, the, we talked about the, the fluid as well, it is quite hot. And with an, as an advantage with the, regarding to the power generation, but it also is contaminated with, with different. Uh, chemicals. I mean, the, these temperatures we are working with are, are not no, unknown at all. I mean, there are conventional power plants operating at supercritical conditions, even higher temperature and higher pressure. And the difference is, though, that the the their uh, fluid they are using is like a, well, super clean. It's is treated before entering the cycle and. And if something goes wrong, you can actually shut down part of it, bypass or whatever. It, it, those are the challenges, however, which needs to be solved in in the in the uh, when utilizing this kind of fluid from geothermal. And this uh, gives uh, uh, well, we need to have more the the valves we are using compared to the other. Uh, in conventional power plants at this or, or higher temperatures, um, we need to have those more robust and, and able to withstand the, 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 these conditions. And it's also difficult, for example, I mean, we've only got a one well, so we can't bypass it. Once we are on up low on, on surface, we would have multiple uh, ways. So actually, they could be still continued discharging or flowing well can continue to flow even if some part has been shut down so you have like a different ways for the fluid and that is actually one of the, the the it is a huge advantage to have the well constantly flowing 
So it not not to cool it down. The best way, the best way is to keep it, maintain it in a, in a hot condition. Now the utilization would require, and this is something which uh, cleaning and, and making the 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 fluid, yeah, make it for using it in, in, for power generation. Uh, and, and there are some pilot plant uh, and has been was developed or being developed, started being developed in the ITTP one in Karabla. And that means that we need to clean out the, the, the silicia and clean out the, the gases and by washing the fluid. But there were also at the same time there were some also some some uh, protest ongoing where uh, looking at the possibility of using it without um, washing the, the fluid. I mean, when we start wa washing the fluid, we quench the steam. So we actually are currently using some of the, or lose some of the energy or some of the exergy, which could be otherwise could be used before power generation. And but and, and there may be some possibilities there to to uh, to uh, yeah may, some. Uh, the processes where actually you can utilize this fluid in, in the very hot and super heat or hot conditions. It's basically using some chemical filters rather than liquid to wash the steam or scrub it as we call it. But without the, the without losing the acid the, acidity. Yeah. 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 And that but even when doing that, we find that, the, and even losing the acidity, we lost some efficiency being lost. We, well, assuming the well can be drilled, etc., and it's producing, it is a very, it is a very quite feasible, even by using a conventional geothermal, um, uh, conventional, uh, uh, yeah, methodology or, 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 or units. Well, um, we're getting within 15 minutes or so of our time, and we're getting a lot of good questions um, from our audience. So I want to kind of address some of those. One of the questions is, is a lot of panels so far in Pivot have been talking about particle drilling or other forms of new drilling techniques. What are the thoughts of, on the group um, on the viability of this technology? I think Sorry. well, it's all all new drilling technologies which are being developed are, are very interesting. I think that's one of the major challenges, especially in terms of economics and how to make drilling more efficient. Uh, we've been using conventional tricone drill bits uh, for our geothermal projects, and it's been quite successful. But uh, if you're going to drill longer wells, obviously the drill time is going to get longer and, and that's one of the main drivers for, for cost reduction is to look at how can we drill faster and in this kind of uh, formations. So personally, I'm, I'm not a, an expert in, in particle drilling or, or plasma drilling or, or other of these new novel types of drilling, but I'm very excited to, to see and, and even try in the future how this will work in our uh, formations. Well, actually, well, and one the cooling uh, during the drilling has been well, uh, that has been critical for for the technology we have been using, and uh, yeah, that that is that's how, how it has been possible to to, to actually drill to have it flush it and cool it sufficiently. Obviously, we can develop a technology where you don't need to cool it. There's uh, there maybe quite a lot of opportunities there. I, I would like any any drilling technology that can lower cost. So. Please bring it on. Okay, so and the then, drillers, they say, uh, you don't need a lower cost, just have a more productive wells. Yeah, well, that. But also, we, we mentioned that uh, we've seen that both in IDTP1 and 2, and, and possibly other super hot wells, that uh, when you're having such a large temperature difference between the drilling fluid and the rock formation, the wells tend to get unstable. So any method that can allow us to, to keep the temperature inside the, the borehole while we're drilling higher, is going to be helpful in that sense. There have also been some uh, regarding the, the uh, uh, this cooling has also the other part of that, the other side of the coin there is that the, there has been 
a possible uh, stimulation of the well. So actually by, by having this great temperature difference, you might actually have cracked or, or make some, some formation, uh, uh, yeah, improved the, 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 or stimulated actually the well. Yeah. But anyway, that can be probably can. Yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah, so, sorry, no, it's just because uh, Christian mentioned mentioned cooling, cooling of the formation and uh, that stimulates the well. And, and this is known that we, well known that we stimulate uh, permeability by injecting cold water. And uh, one of the, the uh, like, approach to this deep heating utilization that we are uh, thinking of uh, is to not, necessarily to, to produce the fluid, uh, that can be very technologically challenging, but we might, uh, with our current uh, technology, uh, inject into hot formations and, and support uh, our conventional systems from below. Uh, that might also be a, a solution to this, this uh, task of, of, of uh, deep utilization. Yes. Uh yeah, yeah. To the sorry <laughs> no no you're fine actually this question is for you what are the plans for the Kropla magma project as a spin-off from the first iceland deep drilling project yes uh, we are uh, planning to drill at least two wells in the Kropla geothermal field in northeast iceland exactly at the location where we drilled well iddp1 into magma in 2009 and uh, so the plan is to drill uh, first uh, well to install uh, monitoring equipment and, and, and measuring equipment to try to understand both the top of the magma body and the formation, let's say 100 meter above the magma, and then drill a follow-up well, which will be what you call manipulation well, where we will try to stimulate the formulation and possibly even produce fluid from that formation. And we can maybe monitor the impact of production from the first well. So this is a, a, a project which is a, a cooperation between the disciplines of volcanology and volcanological monitoring and geothermal energy for, and, and, and try to make these two disciplines help each other to both being able to install monitoring equipment into volcanoes, but at the same time use the, the volcanological expertise to help us to locate and identify interesting uh, super hot reservoirs. So kind of on the similar lines, what about drilling closed loop into magma chambers? Is that possible? And what are the risks? Super exciting, I would say. Super exciting. Uh, if we can drill into magma, then that's possible. Uh, the next thing would be to install uh, possibly an insulated pipe into the middle, so we can inject water on the in the annulus down to the bottom where it will pick up heat. And I guess the magic is then to extract it to surface through the inner tube without losing heat on the way up. There are a few companies uh, looking at this at the moment. I think there are quite a few patents being uh, sent out at the moment. And I think there is a lot of excitement in the geothermal and even in the wider energy uh, industry for this technology. And we talked about all the challenges and difficulties with the gases, which are very corrosive with the silica which could cause both scaling or if it enters all the way into the turbine of all the challenges and difficulties that can cause but with this case you are having a pure fluid being circulated around and around inside the borehole and this pure fluid can be handled much easier on the surface than the original geothermal fluid itself so I think this is very exciting. There may be a little bit less energy efficiency in it, but the but the benefits are so much on on the utilization side. So this would be we will have would be having like a similar to conventional 
power plants I mentioned before, where you can actually treat the fluid and have it well. I would though be a little bit concerned regarding the uh, what happens when the uh, magma cools down and turns into rock. Uh, and uh, as the rock tends to be, uh, well, that's quite uh, is isolating. And there's one thing which, uh, in this respect, which was I found at least quite interesting when ITDP one was heating up, and it was locked. The temperature locking was run. We found actually that the 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 temperature at the very bottom of the well, which was closest to magma, only a few tens of meters. We, Thing that was quite a slow in heating up, it took a long time to heat up that while the above it was was uh, much quicker. So, but anyway, this is the same challenges as people are, uh, are facing as when uh, generally using this uh, well, what you may call it as a single well concept. Yeah, both well, look uh, well, it's with conventional with the technology available technology is still very uh, difficult to was well, a big challenge to drill into super hot environment and uh, i'm not sure if well uh, anytime soon we are not going to put anything more co complicated into such a well and also if we isolate the circulation from the formation as as uh, christian mentioned uh, uh, that uh, might uh, I think the cooling, uh, the cooling is really creating uh, the permeability that is uh, pumping fluid into this formation. That is what creates permeability. And I'm not sure that uh, a closed loop will do that trick. Uh, we are not also, we just, we don't know exactly how these uh, formations behave. We have uh, relatively limited data. I think the best data is from the Ikrabla. ITTP1, and we have also some data from uh, hot wells elsewhere. But uh, I think the main point here is uh, that uh, these hot formations are not necessarily very uh, permeable, and uh, we can create their or first create permeability in those formations by injecting into them. Kristen, this question is for you. Can you go into the needs for the cementing in a little more detail? Yeah, well, the cementing, uh, it's important to have the fully cemented from bottom to the casings needs to be fully cemented from bottom to surface. Uh, and it, there, there are several challenges to 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 uh, to have uh, this good cementing. And, and it has mostly to do with the actually uh, to pumping the cement and how to how get it uh, in place and there are we may expect leakages and we may expect uh, uh, different temperature profile in the well and uh, and those uh, and, and there is a uh, also quite long so it's kind of have, have will have a effect or maybe a collapse issues even in it as well and uh, what has happened actually is in this that we we have not been fully successful in, in, in either an IDB1 or two, and that had, had to do with the temperature, had to do with that there was a, the, 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 well, didn't, were not successful in having it flow in, in a way which was planned. Actually, it was trying to, uh, to uh, cement it from upside down, meaning an, an annulus, so it's, uh, which is considered also should have, have been the best approach. But the, 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 these are challenges which uh, turn out to be one need to, uh, and there's also quite important there in these uh, having those cementing method to have uh, several alternatives. So obviously one could shift from one to, to another if, if things do not work, and that is something which needs to be developed better. So in Iceland and abroad, what is the pathway that this group sees to making deep drilling to super hot resources scalable? Well, who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> we, we believe, and we have been promoting that, we believe Iceland is the best testing ground to start and to 
to both because our communities have a little bit of experience before, but we are also quite open for international cooperation and, and willing to work with people from, from other countries. Uh, but I think also, and, and, and as you said, we, we already know where the, for example, the hot bodies are, where the potential are in our country. And then obviously, I think if we get quite a good experience with this in Iceland, for example, this can be applied in so many different parts of the world. Basically, all where we have volcanically active areas, uh, obvious to start in, in experienced geothermal countries like Italy, New Zealand, Japan, and the US, and, and Indonesia, and other places. But then the potential is, is great in, in parts where there is uh, not that much geothermal utilization yet, but quite a bit of volcanic activity, such as in the Caribbean, and in, in Central and Latin America and, and, and other parts of the world. So this is in some places almost the, well, I would like to say the best option to generate green renewable energy for, for communities. We're kind of leading to this there, question. Oh, go ahead. No, so there are, are uh, other deep uh, utilization projects ongoing, like uh, the, the Japan Beyond Brittle and uh, the New Zealand project, uh, Next Generation, I guess it, I think it's called. So there are some efforts uh, all the world to, to try to, to address this uh, issue. Yeah, one of the questions was, is the IDDP consortium actively seeking partnerships to begin considering taking their operations to other regions of the world? So, Bajarni, you kind of touched on that a little bit. We welcome all uh, new partners. So. Absolutely. Okay. Perfect. So, Paul Gunnar, he's the lead now. <laughs> <laughs> so we know who to contact. <laughs> yeah. So uh, another question is, is EGS possible in high temperature igneous rocks? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it should be possible because if, if you if you cool down, uh, as you mentioned here earlier, if you cool down the rock, if you have any permeability and you can cool the rock, you will get increased permeability. So you. And this is also believed to be the process of all, the natural processes of heat transfer between uh, the hot bodies and the water circulation. It, it works in the way that uh, the rock pulls down, gets brittle, breaks up, and the water can access it. And then this frontier moves into the hot formation. And what we would be doing by injection is uh, to mimic this process, this process, and, and speed it up. So this should be applicable in. in, in yeah, even more it should it actually should be easier, should be better. In, in, the in hotter. Hotter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So are the materials used at IDDP custom designed or off the shelf designs? Uh, I would say more. most of it uh, off the shelf. Mm -hmm. And okay. try That's to right. use off the shelf as long as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Gunnar, do you want to add? Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is true. We, uh, well, we, I can add to that that we are we are looking into some new uh, designs. As I mentioned, we are in a, in a project called Compass where we are trying to uh, develop uh, new technologies to to tackle these problems of of what we faced in IDP one and IDP two. And actually, as mentioned there is that the. the we had the valve failure, which we was a little bit of a surprise for us in, in ITDP one, which uh, was an off-shelf component, which we had a good faith in, but didn't work in the conditions. So there's some development needs to be done. All right, well, we're coming down to the wire here. So I just want to open it up. Any closing comments um, you guys would like to make? The energy is down there. Let's get it. <laughs> yes, yes. I also would like to mention that we actually have, has quite a lot has been done since the beginning in 2000, uh, year 2000 in this project. So we have learned quite a lot on the way.
And we're going to continue to learn in this space and advance it until we can get it scalable, economical, and um, you know, bring geothermal everywhere. I really appreciate everyone. Thank you so much for your time today. I hope everyone enjoyed the panel discussion. Appreciate you all.